This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and welcome to AutoLine This Week. Today's topic, how do you make the transition from traditional internal combustion engines to battery electric vehicles? That's a big issue for companies that make parts and components for internal combustion engines. What are they going to do? Well, let's get to the bottom of it today because I've got three experts that really know what's going on in this regard. Alicia Massey is the senior managing director of the company called B. Riley, which is an advisory company. Michael Robinet is the executive director of automotive advisory services at IHS Market. And Hugh Blacksell is managing director for Mali Powertrain. Mali, of course, being a supplier, longtime supplier to the auto industry in this regard. I wanna thank all three of you for joining me on today's discussion. And Hugh, let me start with you. Mali is right in the middle of this. You make all kinds of parts and components that go into internal combustion engines. But you know, the sun sets out there for the internal combustion engine someplace. What is Molly's strategy? How do you handle the transition? Uh, that's a good question, I think. And there's there's a lot we're doing to, uh, to, to sort of evolve ourselves and develop. So uh, first of all, I guess it's been discussed and presented as a dual strategy. So, you know, we are looking at uh, um, trying to maintain our IC engine uh, portfolio and support our customers for as long as we possibly can do, uh, while still developing, um, you know, new technology, motors, um, battery technology, uh, even fuel cells. So we're trying to do both uh, at the moment to try and sort of uh, manage the transition. At the end of the day, um, the market is the demand. Uh, The OEMs are supplying the market. It, we've got to support our OEMs and our customers. So uh, that's our aim uh, to support our customers and keep doing so. Um, and it's a diverse customer base as well. So we've got, you know, light duty, um, small engine manufacturers, as well as the heavy duty truck. So it's quite a broad activity and all of those are changing at different rates. So we've got to support each and every one of them. Good. I look forward to getting into more details of that strategy. Alicia, what are you telling your clients? I, you, you recently did a deep dive into this whole transition. What'd you learn and how are you advising clients? Uh, thank you, John. Yes, it's, it's a quite a diverse group of uh, suppliers who are in the powertrain space, as I know Hugh probably knows and Michael probably knows. It's a $500 billion market, so it's a huge market. And it's made up of all different types of suppliers, whether you're top tier like Male, um, or if you're, you know, down tier, all supplying the all supplying the uh, the powertrain market. And you have actually the larger ones have a lot more opportunities, uh, as Hugh said, to do dual strategies. The smaller suppliers maybe not. So they're going to have to think about a sunset and how they work with their, you know, their tier ones, their tier twos. Uh, it's not easy. This is going to be, automotive is not easy to begin with. Um, with everything else that's going on, we're still recovering from COVID. We have supply chain issues with materials. Um, on top of that, having to go from a, 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 a technology that's been around for a hundred years to a whole new set of technologies it's extremely difficult for these suppliers. But the larger ones um, in particular uh, will be able to do dual strategies. Some are, some are approaching it through M&A, some are approaching it through divesting their powertrain, and some look like they are simply going to ride it out. So it really does depend on how financially you want to um, make the change. Michael, I, yeah. I'd love to get your input. You know, you, you do so much forecasting. You know what future products are coming. You do forecasts for production and sales volumes and the like. How do you see this going? Well, John, it actually goes well beyond powertrain. I mean, if you think about what happens in driveline, you think about what happens in even other systems as so the value chain changes uh, with a BEV vehicle versus what we call a multi-energy platform, which has an ICE and maybe uh, other forms of propulsion like a mild hybrid or a full hybrid. Um, you know, in the end, there's going to be every every uh, supplier is going to have a different strategy. Some of those strategies are going to be foisted on them. 
the OEMs and actually some of the financial organizations are well ahead of them. OEMs may say to themselves, you're too small. Uh, my volumes are going down. I need to winnow down my supply base. So some of that may occur. Uh, banks mm -hmm. that give money out to uh, and supply uh, bank lines to some of these companies might say, you know what? I don't think you're you're going to be a survivor in this. So there's there's a, there's a lot of different players uh, that are that are part of this ecosystem, and in the end, there's going to be uh, essentially probably three or four different strategies. Ride it out because I've got some aftermarket. Maybe I want to double down and be a consolidator uh, in this space. Maybe I want to shift. A lot of it is due to uh, what your process is. If you can if you can mill gears, why can't you do some similar types of processes for a reduction box? or uh, a spline for an e-motor or something like that. So there's lots of different strategies here, but to be honest with you, suppliers that are just thinking about it now, uh, it's it's almost to a point of being too late. Yeah, great point. It might be too late, but Hugh, what do you think about what Michael's saying? Can you use existing uh, manufacturing facilities to transition into making parts for battery electrics? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's definitely something Marla does. You, you obviously know as well as everybody knows Marla for pistons, but uh, you know we're we're a big manufacturer of cooling systems as well and uh, and plastic components. So we've got uh, big business units that can that can pivot. Um, uh, cooling systems are required for uh, battery electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, fuel cells, fuel cell technology. Um, so those business units are in the in the in the process of transitioning and, and supporting those uh, OEMs that are moving in that direction. Um, and uh, <clears throat> our sort of maybe maybe more traditional uh, engine components is, is, is really more about developing products for um, the market that's going to remain as we see for as long as possible. So, so heavy duty. So we see that. And, and as Alicia said, M&A um, uh, comes into it as well. Uh, you know, Marla has been uh, acquiring companies that can can sort of bolster that portfolio that cooling systems uh plastic components and that sort of thing that uh, um uh, it can it can add to the uh, the portfolio and help us along the way alicia uh very interesting what you you said of one strategy could be just ride the internal combustion engine into the sunset even though electric vehicle sales are growing phenomenally and we know that's the future of where the industry is going that could take a couple of decades. So what do you think of the strategy of maybe consolidate, dominate, and ride it into the sunset? I think some people are actually truly thinking about that. And, uh, and it's interesting to hear all of the different um, strategies that are out there. The one thing that's really important for whatever strategy that you pick is that you have sufficient cash flow to do those things that you need to do. And, you know, we took a look at the top, you know, 18. Actually, it was, a mi it was a mix between the really big guys and some of the smaller guys. And when I say smaller guys, I'm talking about guys that are, you know, somewhere between two and four billion. I mean, that's not really small, but that's small compared to, say, Amale. Um, and those guys, I think, are going to have a tough time because they're already at sort of a debt to equity ratio that is somewhat challenged coming out of COVID and coming out of, um, you know, with the supply chain um, ups and downs that we're having with materials. So one of the things that's super important and critical is to make sure you have the financial, financial flexibility to do the things that you need to do, regardless of the strategy. Looking at like the top 18, they're spending about 12% of sales in either R&D or uh, CapEx, which is very, very significant, 12% of sales. Typical years, CapEx, three to 5%. So everybody's gearing up. And so the, so the issue is going to be, you know, do you have the financial flexibility to invest in these new technologies, which people have already been investing, as you mentioned. You've already been, if, and if you're just starting, you're behind the eight ball. But it's gonna be a continuum. And you have sort of what I would call your day job too. You, you have the process of making parts and make, getting them out and everything. So there has to be um, the ability to have the financial flexibility to do all of those things. And some people are gonna be winners and some people are not gonna be winners. That's just, I think the ultimate um, outcome is that there will be some companies that will no longer exist five, 10 years from now. 
yeah, Michael, how long is this going to go on? I mean, it, it'd be real easy if we knew bank up a, a year 2030. After 2030, all internal combustion engines will be banned. But we know that's not the case. Yeah. And so how long is this going to go on, do you think? Well, I mean, uh, it'll be interesting. I mean, uh, the 2035 number has been bandied about by an OEM, and uh, that's aspirational. So, you know, certainly uh, I think the goal is to, to take a good part of different portfolios for many of the larger manufacturers and transition to BEV where, where required, um, especially if you've got exposure to Europe and China, uh, that, that's going to be very, very critical. But you know, our, our thought is that certainly ICE uh, and ICE would start stop is going to be around in some form, you know, past 2035, but it's going to be declining. And I think uh, I, I think what's going to happen is, is is people think of the industry and some that don't understand our industry very well, think of it in a very linear or binary fashion. There actually are three different timelines underway right now. There's the development timeline, which from a BEV perspective the OEMs are, are focusing, I would say, the vast majority of their energy towards uh, and, and incremental technology uh, and capital towards, uh, towards the BEV side of the equation. So you've got the development side. Then you've got the production side. When do we actually start producing those offerings? And that, that again, it is probably going to be a couple of years away from here. Uh, in terms of uh, real growth of what's going to happen with BEV. And then there's the whole aftermarket side. What happens with the aftermarket? So we're, we're solidly in the development timeline right now. And, and you know, in talking to a couple of OEMs, they basically have said, you know what, unless uh, we can save money by maybe putting some capital out front, uh, or maybe there's a lightweighting opportunity, or we need it for regulatory, we're not going to spend an awful lot of money on our multi-energy platforms. We're going to be focusing our energy on the BEV side. And I think suppliers need to really understand that that's going to be the case for the next uh, two cycles that are left in ice. Mm -hmm. Hugh, uh, what are you doing at Mali? I mean, wh wh where do you see the sunset? As you said, the market's really going to determine how this all goes. Are people really going to run out and start buying all kinds of electrics or are they going to stick with their piston engine products? But how does Mali see it? Wh when do the lines cross? Uh, it's, it's an interesting one, because I guess there's, there's a legislation driver um, so we're going to see that happening, and we've already seen the uh, <clears throat> announcement from the, uh, the EPA uh, and, and maybe the new administration's intent uh, to sort of move much more towards a European, um, uh, hopefully non-technology driven um, approach. But then we've got the, the consumers. And um, I mean, it's, it's a problem that we're discussing in, in Michigan right now is, uh, um, you know, how do we encourage can even a hybrid vehicle and all the different different makes of it. So um, it's a real challenge um, to really form that transition, um, and it also varies by by marketplace. So I don't think we can consider ourselves to be like Europe. Um, you know, the the driving patterns here are very different. The vehicle types are here are very different. So I mm -hmm. think there's going to be a unique solution for us and for our our marketplace, uh, and we need to look towards those. Um, Marl has been looking at uh, um, mild hybrid systems um, and uh, and also full hybrid systems that are, um, are capable of very good miles per gallon um, and could achieve quite a lot of the, what's proposed to be is the legislation. But um, that may not be the uh, the actual end game. We, we may need to go f to full electric vehicle, in which case, you know, our R&D teams are uh, um, designing motors um, and uh, and developing battery systems that would support that future future need. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very engaged in all of those levels. Uh, and another one I'd throw into the pot uh, just there is, of course, um, uh, future fuels. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we haven't touched on that, but uh, uh, e-fuel type technology is, again, an area that uh, uh, we've got to keep an eye on. Um, we've got some big fuel companies out there that may want to have a business in the future. Yeah, just so viewers who may not know, e-fuels really uh, getting a lot of attention in Europe right now from an R&D standpoint, which would be low carbon fuels mixed with gasoline. So you could have dramatic reductions in CO2 emissions with an internal combustion engine. Because mm -hmm. as I keep pointing out, the problem isn't with the engine, it's the carbon in the fuel that's the problem. <laughs> so if you can take that carbon out of it, 
who knows, maybe the piston engine can live a lot longer, but we'll see where they go with those e-fuels. But Alicia, I wanna come back to you because Hugh raised a really good point. He's talking about consumers in the United States, maybe Michigan uh, specifically, mm -hmm. but Male is an international corporation and Europe is moving at a much different pace than the United States, so is China. How do you, as a multinational corporation, deal with these different ways that the uh, world is moving forward on electrification? Uh, carefully, right? Um, <laughs> one, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, um, it, because looking at the very large suppliers, it seems that you must have an incredible collaboration with your customers in terms of you know what you i mean for and in particular going from ice to ev because it's so different that that you just can you speak a little bit about and maybe this will answer your question john um you've got these different markets that are so um at different stages of the ev life cycle um is there some uh uh, is there some likeness in, in the in the types of technologies between those um, between those different regions, or are they all different? And that even adds a, another layer of complexity on going from just say the concept of ice to EV. Um, so I'd, I'd answer that um, really probably with respect to fuel cells um, to start with, just because it, it feels easier. Um, Marla does a portfolio of um, balance of plants, so everything except for the fuel cell, every so all mm -hmm. of those systems that support it. Um, and uh, we've developed those for passenger cars. Um, the, the market over here is really focused for fuel cells on, um, on heavy duty and medium duty mm -hmm. applications. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're looking into do is to try and sort of uh, uh, increase the capacity the size of those components so development to suit the bigger applications um, and that's what we'd like to do in the us um, and actually the department of energy is also trying to do the same thing to try to sort of leverage the uh, the marketplace so the government is trying to push it uh, and we're trying to take advantage of that uh, use some of the base knowledge we've got from you know previous fundamental research and apply it to the marketplace here so that might be the uh, the best sort of practical example, but the same applies in, in, in other applications where there's a lot more of a push, um, obviously in Europe towards the battery electric um, development, mm -hmm. whereas we're really, um, you know, thinking more about hybrids and we, we collaborate very closely with, with all of the R&D groups, um, with the OEMs. Mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. the group I'm responsible for uh, is an engineering service provider. So we work on projects with them to try and help mm -hmm. them develop solutions. They may be their solutions or they may be ours. Um, right. But we, we, we try and collaborate with them to try and help solve the problems at the, at the R&D stage before they go towards production. Yeah, Michael, mm -hmm. how do you see this? How, how do, yeah. uh, what, what's your advice to companies that have got to juggle business units in different regions that are uh, uh, advancing at a different rate? Yeah, John, I got a different way to answer that question that you asked originally. I, I think we're finding that there's a new economies of scale that is rising. You know, we had an internal combustion engine economies of scale with respect to uh, different, different engine families, different transmission families. And then we kind of settled in, hey, if it's between half a million a year and two million a year, you know, that works for us. But in the battery space, it's, it's really, quite frankly, a completely different world. And the economies of scale is going to actually favor much higher volumes and much higher economies of scale. And the reason why I bring this up is that, so from a regional perspective, if, if in China and in Europe, you're, you're building uh, you know, a preponderance of components towards BEV or, or full hybrid or you know, other more advanced levels of uh, electrified propulsion, but yet in North America, uh, you're, you're not quite there yet and it, it's going to be rising. You know, you're going to want to move forward quickly uh, because the, the, this new economy of scale is going to, uh, you know, divide the winners and losers fairly quickly over time, especially as the industry realizes that we need to get down to a couple of different technologies and the standards start to come in. Right now, battery engineering and, and e-motors and drives, it's the Wild West. It's all over the place. 
Uh, and, and over time, there'll be sort of a condensing or a consolidation down to certain technologies that really work and then could be modified in the future. I think they'll uh, they'll also, Michael, be uh, be very regional in the battery side mm-hmm. of things. I, I, we, I can't see us um, doing development and, in fact, testing of batteries um, uh, over in, in the US for Europe or vice versa. We're, we're going to need that technology and that capability here, which um, so if and this comes to an economic competitiveness sort of uh, uh, point, uh, we need to be capable in all of these areas in the US to be able to compete globally uh, and apply our technology. Mm-hmm. So uh, we need we need some legislation and some direction to move us in in the right into the right direction to compete with in, with Europe and China um, mm-hmm. and uh, enable us to uh, to have that capability and the resources and the manufacturing here in the US. Alicia, it was interesting. So, you were so, saying. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I I was just going to add on to the comment about the legislation. So with the latest Biden package, right, his infrastructure package, there's $174 billion earmarked for EVs. And while it hasn't been sort of, um, I think, laid out exactly what it's going to do, is that going to be enough to drive us closer to Europe and to China, which I think is really where we want to ultimately get. Yeah, Michael, um, ha, ha, have you done different scenarios on that? Has, has yeah. your forecast changed if the Biden plan goes through? Well, certainly our forecast did change with the new administration. I, mean, I think we'd be foolish to say that it, that it didn't because we know that the current, the, the current, the new administration is, is gonna be much more focused on uh, setting up an EV infrastructure um, and, and driving forward in that respect versus the former administration, which maybe quite, wasn't quite as much. We saw that from the regulations, from the emissions regulations. Um, is $174 billion going to get us to where Europe and China are? Absolutely not. Uh, it's going to start the runway, and, and it's going to be a number of different facets. It's, it's consumer attitudes, it's cost, it's the charging infrastructure. Um, you know, as, as we well know, Europe is, is much different than Japan versus China. It's something very interesting. Um, there's a major manufacturer in China, or excuse me, in Japan, sorry, in Japan, that because of the lack of uh, the electrical uh, charging grid for vehicles, they're going to they're gonna, uh, bring out a, uh, basically the equivalent of a BEV that has an ICE on board, then the only reason why the ICE is there is just to completely generate power for the battery. Now you might call that in some respects a full hybrid, but the ICE is not there to drive the vehicle whatsoever. So because I don't have a charging grid, I'll just put an engine in front. It's still in some respects a BEV. So there's gonna be different flavors for different markets, but it would be very interesting, 174 billion starts the runway, but gets us nowhere close to where Europe and China are going to be uh, over the next five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hugh, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, the administration's uh, commitment to electric vehicles? And, and does that change any of Molly's planning? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, we were pushing in that direction anyway. Um, so <clears throat> our customers were, uh, all of our customers were pushing in that direction. So uh, we were we were moving uh, with their needs. Um, but uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased to see it. Um, it. I think it gives us some direction. I think all of the industry needs a target to achieve. It needs to be not technology based, but we need a target to achieve. It needs to be clear. Um, I was certainly personally very concerned that the US would get left behind um, with with technology. And so I think this is a this is a great way for the whole of the industry as well as the society to 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 move forward. Uh, Alicia, earlier on, you mentioned that some of these uh, suppliers are now spending 10 to 12 percent of sales on R&D and CapEx, which, as you point out, is a very high number for them. What's your advice? Do they do you just tell them, hey, stop all your development of internal combustion engines and just put it into electric or, or what do you tell them? You know, it gets back to it gets to, back to helping them, as you say, develop a strategy. And you know, as as the work that I've done and, you know, I've done this now for 25 years, I've worked with suppliers who lost their way in in their in their strategy decision making and have fallen on you know difficult financial times so what you always want to do with a company is to understand first and foremost what is their what is their strategic competence 
What is it that they bring to the table for their customers? And then build around, uh, build around that a strategy. A strategy could be, hey, maybe I don't belong in automotive anymore. Maybe I belong, I can do these same things for a different industry. So it, it really does depend on what is what are the competencies of the company, of their management team, and number one, and number two, what are their financial resources? And through those two things, you can help them define what their best strategy is, whether it is acquisitions, whether it is divestitures, whether it is, um, as Hugh mentioned, a dual strategy of uh, keeping their ice but developing the EV. Uh, it, it really does depend on the competencies of their team, of what they have accomplished and what they have financially. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a study. And John, frankly, I would R add quick, a lot. We're down to the very end. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so I would add to that. It, it, it depends on the ownership structure. It could be a family run company that they, they look, they look uh, uh, downstream and say, I don't have any generations to take this over. I'm a regional supplier. Right. Maybe it makes sense for me from an ownership perspective to not take all this risk. It's all about risk. And there's a lot of it out there right now. Yeah. So it's all about, do I want to take this risk? Otherwise, I'm just going to find an exit strategy or sell off one of my divisions. And that could be another strategy. A lot of these mid-sized $2 to $4 billion suppliers, they're not only, at, not only in one space, they usually have two or three. They might let one go and then focus on the other two that are more BEV positive or at least BEV agnostic, and they see a future. Exactly. Okay. A lot of risk out there. But Hugh, Alicia, Michael, thanks for all your insights for today's discussion. Thank you, John.